Good morning, everybody, and what a wonderful Easter season. Who would have imagined this kind of weather this early in April, but we'll enjoy it. And uh, glad that you are taking uh, time apart from being outdoors in this glorious weather to be with us as community of faith in worship. Uh, this morning and for the next few Sundays, we will begin with a outreach minute, and I uh, turn the service over to Francis Sold to lead in that. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of outreach, I'm announcing that this year we will run an appeal for uh, summer day camps, and today I'll talk to you about uh, the Cote d'Ange Council support for the camps in that area. Uh, this year, because of all government restrictions, there'll only be two camps open and the government has quite uh, strict rules about it. So this year it'll be mostly fine arts and crafts and an emphasis on feeding these kids because some of them have maybe not been getting their lunches at school. So, in the next couple of weeks, you'll hear about the other camps. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe worship God. Those of you who have a worship candle, I invite you to light it now.
May I be open to your spirit, O God, and may your radiance surround me in this time set apart. The grace of our sovereign Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We meet you, O Christ, in many a guise, your image we see and simple and wise, hymn 183 in Voices United. we love our neighbors, but do you honestly expect us to share all with them? This story from the early church paints a lovely picture, but surely it is merely a fantasy remembrance of Luke's. Yes, we uphold that we like to believe that we are more willing to share than our southern neighbors, as we feel that we are a generous people. That is why we embrace the fantasy that Reverend Tommy Douglas found little pushback in introducing Medicare. God enable us to see the places where the teachings of Christ and the workings of your spirit still challenge us to grow as a people. Help us to do more than talk brotherly love. Free us to live it as best as we can in meaningful ways that further the coming of your kingdom. We beseech you now to hear the petitions on behalf of others that we bring before you in silent prayer. To these prayers, Holy One, we add our prayers for Elizabeth, our Queen, and the members of the royal family who are grieving the loss of the Prince Philip. And we take time to remember his contribution to our lives. We pray that people might realize the seriousness of this pandemic. 
and the variance and the danger they now pose. We pray for responsibility and compassion for others. We pray for those on the first lines who are exhausted and bewildered by the lack of responsibility shown by fellow citizens. For the leaders in government who are trying to do their best to ensure the safety and well-being of all and the economy. We pray for those families that now are just seen as numbers of people lost. They're grieving someone dear to them. We pray for the other issues that have been swept somehow under the carpet because of the centrality of the pandemic. We pray for justice, for human dignity, for the rights and liberties of all humanity and of the planet itself. O oh God, hear our prayer. And in your love, answer. These are the concerns that weigh heavily on our hearts this morning, that we now turn over to the grace of Christ. Amen. You tell me that the Lord is risen from Voices United 185.
Hear now this reading from the Acts of the Apostle, reading chapter 4, verses 31 to 37. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the witness of the early church. Thanks be to God. Our psalm we're singing this morning, Mire Que Bueno, 133, Psalm 133, 856 in Voices United. The gospel reading this morning is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, 
was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Write these words on our hearts, dear God. And I have been told that is a C, pure and simple. And I don't mean a grade. That was an A+. And now for something completely different. Next slide. In heart and mind, no one uh, claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. Next slide. And laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made to every man or everyone according 
to their need, according to he has need. Whoa, uh, that's different. Uh, we're in that transition from Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection, and now the community coming to terms with all of this. They are now in charge, being the hands and feet and heart of Christ. And how are they going to do this? Well, it is clear in the writings of the writers of the Gospels that the Spirit must be upon them. They must not rely only on their own intellect and own means, but on the Holy Spirit. And here, Luke, remember Acts is the second, it's Luke book two, says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And I pray this morning that we may all be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, so that I can speak the words of God uh, with boldness. Well, that's different. To speak with boldness, because we get into something strange. Remember Luke. Luke is the guy that gave us that lovely, cute scene of the manger and the straw and the donkeys and all the wonderful postcards of Christmas. That's Luke. Well, Luke now gives us this as to what it was like to be at that birthing place of the church. The spirits upon them, the room shakes. Uh, here, does that help? And lo and behold, they decide to live a radically different life. They got rid of everything they had and lived in community and took according to their needs and gave according to their abilities. And uh, somebody studying in the British Museum a long time ago in the Victorian age picked up on that theme, Karl Marx. What happened? We're not like that anymore. Next slide. And it didn't last long if it happened at all. Is this historical recollection by Luke? Or is this an imagined utopia? Because we know that between the fourth and sixth centuries, once the church becomes the official region, religion of the state, uh, the patriarchs of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem acquired enormous wealth in the form of land and gold. I guess they were still in somewhat laying it at the apostles' feet, the overseer's feet. <laughs> That's why the, this morning I polished my shoes, because thank goodness we are in the tradition of the Methodists, who is the Anglican tradition, so apostolic succession continues. I'm waiting. <laughs> no, it's odd that that image of Luke of community and of the freedom of that community doesn't last long. Constantine was a savvy emperor. And some of his early acts was to transfer the authority of the magistrates of Rome to the overseers. And so the magistrates who had processions when they came into the basilica, the courts, like the one you're seeing, only this is religious, but still a basilica. The torchbearers came before them. Then the fasces, the symbol of the power, was processed behind the torches. And then the magistrate, with incense before the magistrate. Sounds... Vaguely familiar, doesn't it, liturgically speaking? He transferred the power, gave the Bishop of Rome palace, 
and boom, things changed. So how do we deal with that story in the Acts of the Apostles? Uh, well, we hide it uh, after the great celebration of Easter. We put it this Sunday, and maybe you won't read it. We'll go to Thomas instead. But maybe there's something there that we do need to look at and do need to examine. Next slide. Well, they tried again to share everything in common and established monastic communities. They tried to reform and go back to a shared reality. Everyone living together and working together, <clears throat> separated by gender, of course. And you end up with this wonderful complex in Cluny in Burgundy in France. Uh, it doesn't go, exist in, in its entirety anymore, but at its heyday, this is what the monastic community of the Benedictines looked like. The black robes. Great authority in France. Perhaps this was the greatest monastery of them all. And oddly enough, about 20 minutes up the road, if you're driving and fall up the river, you come to Taizé. If any of you have thought of going to Taizé and its monastic interpretation, try, they're trying to revive this, not to this scale, obviously, but uh, still in that tradition of making sure the offices are filled uh, of people, of people of faith in both study, prayer, song, some conversation, though Trappist came out of this, and good works. So they tried, but again, it leads to this. What is it about our nature that when we try to do something where we share, it always ends up looking like this? Next slide. Well, maybe we just accept it and Economists have been noting that in the United States, uh, we'll talk about there because it, it doesn't get quite as personal. But between 78 and 2018, the average pay of the bosses of the US largest 350 companies grew by 1,007.5%. Their salaries went up 1,007%. Let's say 1,008, be generous where the increase far outstripped the typical worker's salary growth, which was, let's just say, 12%, 11.9. Bit of a difference there. And it has got worse since then. A promised land by Barack Obama talks about the tax incentives of the last Republican government of the United States and how it further enhanced the wealth of the well-to-do at the expense of cutting programs for the not well-to-do. And the growth in the gap between those that can afford and those that can't has increased dangerously high. We seem to have not learned the lesson of let them eat brioche. And what has happened can happen again. And people finally get fed up with ostentation versus deep poverty and oppression, and on a global scale as well. Many of us are rejoicing that our property values are soaring and soaring and soaring. Well, those of us that have property, the investments aren't doing as well as they did in the heyday of the 80s. But we don't know that our salaries are increasingly radically. And it seems to be, in many cases, external money that's coming in and raising values. And it's a lovely thing until you have to live somewhere else. We seem to be in a bit of a pickle. And where does our faith speak to this? Or does it at all? Is this a separation? of a church and wallet. The next slide. Well, we it's awkward. It's awkward to talk about it. Evangelical churches can. They make no bones about it. The Bible says 10% and 10% it must be. 
and you must show that. And, and certainly the uh, Chinese evangelical church in Burnaby, BC, uh, practices this. Many of the Korean churches practice this. And they have multi-staff facilities and chefs and restaurants and, and are in a way off of monastic communities, except people live in homes and do well. And recall <laughs> from the 70s that group Pink Floyd and their very famous song, Money. And money, it's a crime. Share it fairly. Don't, don't take a slice of my pie. <laughs> In an economy with, for we of faith, we uh, don't like to talk about it. It's sordid, isn't it? It's a crime. Uh, and, and, oh, we want to be charitable. Uh, but as someone, as we will say, you know, that adage, charity begins at home. Next slide. Well, maybe we should join the bandwagon. Prosperity gospel. That's, if you watch the history of the black church, you would have seen segments about this and the wider uh, American phenomenon based on scriptural comments and traditions that God had blessed a holy people that they might prosper. And the acknowledgement that poverty ain't fun. There's an old statement from one of the great black singers, I've been rich and I've been poor and rich is better. Does God want you and me and everyone to be rich or all Christians to be rich? And we hear stories that even the, the great Madame O, Oprah, uh, will board her jet to fly uh, to Houston to attend uh, a, a church service when she feels like it. Should that be what we aspire to? That uh, only then will God bless us and God should bless us and uh, uh, from Evita, if the money keeps rolling in, you don't ask why. Next slide. Charity should begin at home, says Philip Brooks, but should not stay there. Philip Brooks, minister, priest of the Episcopalian Church, Trinity Church on Coffee Square in Boston. You may have heard some of his writings at that other festival. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see they lie. That's Philip Brooks. So charity should begin at home. Yes, we look after our needs, but should not stay there. Well, another cynic writes the following. Next slide. Too many have dispensed with generosity in order to practice charity. Albert Camus. Too many have dispensed with generosity in order to practice charity. The story from Acts is a story of generosity. It's opening the heart. It's the presence of the spirit. It's God working through community to change human nature. To be generous. Generosity doesn't have the attachment of power and hierarchy. Charity does. I dislike the fact that we're called charitable organizations. Why couldn't we be called generous, socially aware, socially concerned? And what's wrong with just being called Christian? Generosity, that God is generous with us, and therefore we are called to 
reflect that generosity as the grace of Christ is upon us so that grace should be extended. It's not ours alone to bank and get interest. The next slide. Because the story this morning from Acts, however we deal with it, is about the power of the Holy Spirit coming in the community, not just in individuals. That all receive these blessings when they testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And grace is upon them all, not just apostles, not just a few, but all that living differently by the Spirit, celebrating the resurrection, the life, the hope that that gives us, brings grace upon us all. And the belief it still does. Even if that is something completely different from the way much of the world lives. Amen. The spring has come, 187 in Voices United. Spirit with us as we enter into a time of silent meditation, and I ask you to follow the directions on the screen.
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Voices United 586, we shall go out with hope of resurrection. forth into this week as a blessed community of faith. One that experiences this grace upon grace in your living. A grace that centers itself in the experience of Jesus. That is surrounded and lifted up by the love of God. That God does not only create, but loves God's creation and loves us as part of that creation. And may the Holy Spirit move amongst us and between us to support us, to advocate for us, and to challenge us to be the people of God we could be. Amen.
This concludes our worship this morning. Thank you for being with us. Your presence enriches our community of faith. And may God's blessing be with you in the week ahead.